Be sure to hop on over to the Spiritual Broadcast Network. It's the go-to place for all things spiritual. You'll discover internet television shows that you won't find anywhere else. You can also choose from hundreds of hours of spiritual documentaries and movies. You'll enjoy on-demand and live internet television programming 24-7. Best of all, we add new dramas, comedies, talk, and reality shows and more on a daily basis. So why spend countless hours searching the web when you can quickly find just what you want on the Spiritual Broadcast Network? Wisdom Through Action is a contemporary, sea-influenced school teaching the work of personal inner development in the system brought to the Western world by G. I. Gurdjieff. Good morning. Welcome to Wisdom Through Action. I'm Kay Smith, your host, along with Cal Gorham. Our program today is the symbolism of the Tarot. In the system of the fourth way, we refer to knowledge as objective and subjective, as it was referred to by Gurdjieff. Our ordinary knowledge, which is based on ordinary methods of observation and verification, scientific theories and so on, is called subjective. Knowledge based upon ancient methods and principles of observation, knowledge of things in themselves, and especially knowledge accompanying an objective state of consciousness, or knowledge of the all, he called objective. The most central of the ideas of objective knowledge is the idea of unity and everything, of unity and diversity. Now, the ancients were much more familiar with this idea than we are, and they tried to find a way of transmitting this idea in a form comprehensible to others while maintaining its completeness and exactitude, as well as safeguarding it from destruction and deterioration. So to do this, the ideas were put into either a philosophical system, which is based on understanding of basic principles, or into a religious system, which endeavored to create an element of faith and emotion that could carry people up to the level of the objective ideas. So the tarot is just such a philosophical system of transmission of knowledge. The tarot is a pack of cards, which is still used around the world for playing, card playing and fortune telling. It is similar to an ordinary deck of playing cards, which are actually a reduced tarot pack. It has the same kings, queens, aces, tens, and so on. There are several different versions of the tarot, consisting of different numbers of cards. It is considered that the most exact reproduction of the oldest tarot is the so-called Tarot of Marseille. Most people are familiar with the Rider Waite deck, which we are going to use in our discussion today. So this pack of cards consists of 78 cards. Of these, 52 are ordinary playing cards with the addition of one picture card in each suit, namely the knight, which is placed between the king, the queen, and the jack. This makes 56 cards divided into four suits, two black and two red, named as follows. Wands for clubs, swords for spades, cups for hearts, and pentacles or discs for diamonds. In addition, there are 22 numbered cards of the major arcana, each representing part of the objective world, which are outside the four suits. This volume? No audio. Okay. This is card five, the Hierophant. Temptation for the lovers. The chariot. Card eight is justice. Nine is the hermit. Card ten is the wheel of fortune. Card 11 is Strength, 12, The Hanged Man, 13 is Death, 14 is Temperance, 15, The Devil, 
16 is the tower, 17 is the star, 18 is the moon, 19 is the sun, 20 is the day of judgment, 21 is the world, and card 20 is the fool. Now it is said that the tarot cards represent an Egyptian hieroglyphic book consisting of 78 tablets which have come down to us in a miraculous manner. In the famous Library of Alexandria that we spoke about in the last show, there were many such books, consisting often of a great number of clay or wooden tablets. Outwardly, the tarot is a pack of cards, but it has an inner meaning that is altogether different. It is a book of philosophical and psychological content, which can be read in many different ways. It is sometimes called a philosophical machine. So I'll give an example of the philosophical interpretation of the whole idea of the book of the tarot. So the tarot is divided into three parts. In the first part, the major arcana, consisting of 21 numbered cards, numbered 1 through 21. The second part consists of a single card, the fool card, numbered 0. And the third part, the minor arcana, which consists of four suits of 14 cards each, or 56 cards. The Fool card is a link between the Major Arcana and the Minor Arcana. All the cards that make up the four suits of the Minor Arcana are equal to the Fool card. In another program, we'll take those four suits and explain how each of those cards represent a part of human psychology and how we can use this knowledge to practically work on ourselves. That program is called We Are Nothing But a Deck of Cards. Coming back to the Tarot as such, if we take 21 cards of the major arcana, again, those are the ones we just showed you, and lay them out in the form of a triangle with seven cards to each side, in the center of the triangle we place a single card, the zero or fool card. And then we enclose the triangle in a square consisting of 56 cards, 14 to each side of the square. That is, each side of the square would be a whole suit. Now we have a representation of the metaphysical relation between God, the triangle, man, the fool card in the middle, and the universe, the square of the four suits. The triangle represents God, the invisible world. The square represents the visible world. The point is the soul of man, and both the invisible and visible worlds are reflected in the soul of man. The square is equal to the point, meaning that the entire visible world is contained in the consciousness or soul of man. And the soul of man is a point having no dimension in the center of the triangle, or we might say the soul of man is a particle of God. As we said, the tarot may be a kind of philosophical machine of which it is possible to ask questions and receive answers. Remember we said in the system, the fourth way, we try to use psychological thinking by which we can see that everything is connected and everything has an inner meaning. Therefore, if we had concern and needed direction in our lives, we might be able to sincerely ask a question and by knowing what the cards represent and how they work, we may be able to intuit an answer. Needless to say, a real tarot reading would be a very serious thing something that a person might base their actions upon, not so much for a pastime of fortune-telling as we often know it. The tarot stands in relation to metaphysics and mysticism as a system of notation, decimal or otherwise, stands in relation to mathematics. It is said to be a synopsis of the hermetic sciences and their various subdivisions. Thus, the tarot includes in itself the study of alchemy, astrology, the Kabbalah, and magic. All of these sciences constitute a single system of the psychological study of man and the universe, as well as his relation to the universe and an indication of the purpose of man's life on earth. At the time when the Tarot was introduced, 
the open study of human psychology was impossible. Torture and the stake awaited those who attempted it. And so the tarot was a way of hiding this knowledge of psychology in symbolism. Now we know that alchemy took as its outer aim the transmutation of lead into gold or the discovery of the elixir of life. Astrology and the Kabbalah took divination and magic, the subjugation of spirits. But the inner meaning of turning lead into gold is the transmutation of the coarse energy into the fine energy in the soul of man. And the inner meaning of the search for the elixir of life is the search for the eternal life and the ways to immortality. In these cases, what is called gold is the same as what is called the kingdom of heaven in the Gospels and Nirvana in Buddhism. When the true astrologer spoke of the constellations and planets, he spoke of the endocrine system and the planetary body types. This is another program which we have coming up in the near future. That is, the properties of the essence and the soul and its relations to God and the world. When the true magician spoke of the subjugation of spirits, elementals, and the like, he spoke of the development of real will in man. He understood this by this, the subjugation of the many little wills, desires, and tendencies in one man to one single individual real I of a man. Of a man. Thus, the Kabbalah, alchemy, astrology, and magic are parallel symbolical systems of psychology and metaphysics. Now the letters of the Hebrew alphabet and the various allegories in the Kabbalah, the names of metals, acids, and salts in alchemy, the names of planets and constellations in astrology, and the names of good and evil spirits in magic, all refer to the same things. The Kabbalah studies the name of God. Jehovah in Hebrew is spelled with four letters, Yod, He, Ba, and He. These four letters have been given a symbolic meaning. The first letter expresses the active principle, principle initiative, initiative. The second letter, the passive principle, inertia. The third, equilibrium, form. The fourth, resultant or latent energy. The Kabbalists affirm that every phenomena and every object consists of these four principles. That is, that every object and every phenomena consists in the divine name, called in Greek the tetragon grammaton, or the words of four letters. So what is the real meaning of this? Well, the Kabbalists asserted that the four principles permeate and compose each and every thing. So by finding these four principles in things and phenomena of quite different categories, a man begins to see analogy between things in which he had previously seen nothing in common. It becomes obvious that everything in the world is constructed according to the same plan, according to the same laws, and in addition, by making these analogies, a man has to exercise the higher parts of his intellect and emotional functions, and thus eventually open up his higher centers. Now the study of the, of the law of the four letters, or the name of Jehovah, can therefore constitute a means for widening consciousness. If the name of God is truly in everything, if God is present in everything, then everything should be analogous to everything else. The smallest part should be analogous to the whole the particle of dust analogous to the universe, and all analogous to God. As in Hermetic philosophy, as above, so below. It's said in speculative philosophy that the physical world exists, but that we do not perceive it as it actually is. The external world around us causes a response in us due to our senses, and our senses are stimulated whenever something changes outside of us. But we cannot see the world as it is, and we never can know exactly its true nature through our senses alone. The Tarot gives us a way to come into contact with the archetypical ideas which will awaken us to the real world, to see the real world through the mind's eye. The Kabbalah is the study of the world in itself, as do alchemy, astrology, and magic. In alchemy, the four principles are represented by fire, water, air, and earth corresponding exactly with the four letters of the name of God. In magic, the four elements corresponding to the four classes of spirits are called elves, water sprites, sylphs, and gnomes. 
In astrology, the four elements correspond to the four cardinal points, the east, the south, the west, and the north, which in their turn may serve to designate four functions or centers of the human being. Again, we will speak about that more in detail in an upcoming show. And all these correspond and were represented by the four beasts of the apocalypse, one with the head of the bull, the second with the head of the lion, the third with the head of the eagle, the fourth with the head of a man, which in turn are combined into one symbol in the form of the sphinx. The sphinx may be seen as the image of the four principles merged into one. The tarot is a combination of the Kabbalah, alchemy, magic, and astrology. In The Theory of Eternal Life by Rodney Collin, a student of P.D. Ospensky, is a thorough investigation of the four worlds that pertain to man, the mineral world, earth, the cellular world, water, the molecular world, air, and the electronic or radiant world, which is fire. This is the same archetypal idea in contemporary scientific language for Western man. The four principles, or the four letters of the name of God, or the four alchemical elements, fire, water, air, and earth, or the four classes of spirits, or the four divisions of man, the four apocalyptic beasts, correspond to the four suits of the tarot, wands, cups, swords, and pentacles. And then there's a further breakdown. So in each of the suits, the king corresponds to the active principle, or fire, the queen for the passive principle, or water, the knight for the neutralizing principle, or air, and the jack for the resultant, or fourth principle, also known as earth. The ace again signifies fire, the two water, the three air, the four earth. Then the fourth principle, combining in itself the first three, begins the new square, becomes the beginning of the new square. The four becomes the first principle, the five the second, the six the third, and the seven the fourth. Further, the seven again is the first principle, the eight the second, the nine the third, and the ten the fourth. The black suits, that is the wands and the swords, express active qualities, energy, will, initiative. The red suits, that is the cups and pentacles, express passive qualities or inertia. Then the first two suits, wands and cups, signify favorable or friendly conditions, and the last two, swords and pentacles, unfavorable or unfriendly conditions. This is a complex arrangement of how the forces work throughout the universe. We will cover this more in depth or on another program that we're going to be doing on forces and laws. Yes, we have a lot of programs coming up. You'll be quite excited to see them all. It must be studied in depth in order to understand it. In this way, the, each of the 56 cards signifies something active or passive, favorable or unfavorable, arising from either a man's will or coming to him from without. Further, the meaning of the cards are complicated in different ways by a combination of symbological meanings of the suits and the numbers. Although the 56 cards represent, as it were, a complete picture of all the possibilities of a life of man, and this is the principle on which is based the use of the tarot for divination. But the philosophical significance of the tarot is incomplete without the 22 cards of the major arcana. And these cards have first a numerical meaning and then a very complicated symbol symbological one. Now, Eliphas Levi said that the tarot is a key which has been regarded as lost for centuries and has now been recovered for us and we are able to open the sepulchres of the ancient world, to make the dead speak, to behold the monuments of the past in all their splendor, to understand the enigmas of every sphinx, and to penetrate all sanctuaries. Among the ancients, the use of this key was permitted to none but the high priests. The tarot is a hieroglyphic and a numeral alphabet, expressing by characters and numbers a series of univer universal and absolute ideas. The tarot is a truly philosophical machine that keeps the mind from wandering. While leaving it initiative and liberty, it is mathematics applied to the absolute, the alliance of the positive and the ideal, 
a lottery of thoughts as exact as numbers, perhaps the simplest and grandest conception of human genius. An imprisoned person with no other book than the Tarot, if he knew how to use it, could in a few years acquire universal knowledge and would be able to speak on all subjects with unequaled learning and inexhaustible eloquence. Also, P. Christian, in his History of Magic, describes the ritual of initiation into the Egyptian mysteries. The initiate sees a long gallery, supported by columns in the form of 24 sphinxes, 12 on each side. On each part of the wall between the two sphinxes, there are fresco paintings representing mystical figures and symbols of the tarot. These 22 pictures face one another in pairs. As he passes the 22 pictures in the gallery, two at a time, the initiate receives instruction from the priest. Each arcanum, made visible and tangible by each of these pictures, is a formula of the law of human activity in its relation to the spiritual and material forces, the combination of which produces all the phenomena of life. We need to see that the tarot cards are actually symbols. A symbol can always be studied from a number of different points of view, and each thinker has the right to discover in the symbol a new meaning corresponding to his own understanding. Symbols are a method of awakening ideas that may be sleeping in us. By means of suggestion, the symbol is meant to stimulate thought and emotion in such a way as to uncover the truth in us, in our spirit. In order that symbols could speak, it is essential that we should have in ourselves the germs of these ideas, the revelation of which constitutes the mission of the symbols. But no revelation whatever is possible if the mind is empty, unimaginative, or inert. Only a symbol can deliver a man from the slavery of words and formula and allow him to attain the possibility of thinking freely. It is impossible to avoid the use of symbols if one desires to penetrate in the many faceted secrets, the mysteries, that are practically impossible to put into words without distorting the truth. For this reason, silence was imposed on the initiates. Occult secrets require for their understanding an effort of mind. They can illuminate the mind inwardly, but they cannot serve as a theme for verbal arguments. It is necessary to penetrate deep into oneself in order to discover it and those who seek it outside themselves are on the wrong path. It is in the sense that the words of Socrates, know thyself, must be understood. In the realm of symbolism, one must not attempt to be too exact. Symbols correspond to ideas, which by their very nature are difficult to embrace and which are quite impossible to reduce to scholastic definitions. Now, some practical examples. If we take the 22 cards of the major arcana and lay them out in pairs, the first with the last, the second with the next to the last, and so on, we may see an interesting relationship. The possibility of such a disposition of the tarot cards is shown by the order of the tarot pictures in the gallery of the mythical temple of initiation. So card one, the magician, depicts the superman or mankind as a whole connecting earth and heaven. Opposite to the fool. This is an individual man, a weak man. The two cards together represent the two poles, the beginning and the end. Card two is the high priestess. She's Isis or hidden knowledge. Opposite to card 21, the world in the circle of time, in the midst of the four principles, that is, the object of knowledge. Card three, the empress, is nature. Its opposite is card 20, the day of judgment, or the resurrection of the dead. This is nature. It is eternally regenerating and revivifying activity. Next is card four, the emperor is the law of four, the life-bearing principle. Its opposite is card 19, the sun. As the real expression of this law, 
and the visible source of life. Card five, the Hierophant, is religion, and opposite it is card 18, the moon, which can be understood as the opposing principle, hostile to religion. In examining the tarot cards, so you might try laying them out yourself to, to see how the opposites reflect to each other. In examining the tarot cards are revealed in the meaning of the symbols and not by the card number. It can be seen that the 22 cards fall into three sets of seven plus one. The first set of seven refers to man. The second set refers to the visible world. And the third set refers to the world of ideas. God, the invisible world. In these three sets of seven cards, with one card in the center, 22 cards of the major arcana, again we see the law of four, the secret doctrine. Card zero, one, six, 15. So I think this will be clip seven, zero, zero, six, run of seven. Cards 1, 0, 6, 15, 7, 9, and 12. The first seven refer to man. The magician represents conscious humanity, or Superman, known to the Kabbalists as Adam Kedman. The fool represents unconscious man, an individual man. Temptation, love, mankind. The devil, or the fall. The chariot, the illusory quest. The hermit, the real quest. The hanged man, attainment. Cards 19, 18, 17, 16, 20, 10, and 13. The second seven refer to the nature or visible world. The sun, the moon, the star, the lightning, the tower, the resurrection of the dead, the wheel of fortune, life, and finally death. Cards 2, 3, 4, 5, 14, 11, 8. The third seven refers to God, the world of ideas, the invisible world, the high priestess, knowledge, the empress, creative power, the emperor, the four elements, the hierophant, representing religion, time, eternity, strength, love, union, and infinity, and truth, or justice. Now the first seven represents the seven steps on the path of man, if taken in time or the seven faces which are expressed in the changes in the being of the man who is working on himself in a conscious school. The second and third sevens, the universe and the world of ideas, each represents separately, and also in combination with the first, a wide field of study. Each of the seven symbological pictures, which refer to the universe, connects a man in a certain way with the world of ideas. And each of the seven ideas connects man in a certain way with the universe. None of the three sevens includes the 21st card, the world, which in this case contains in itself all of the other 21 cards, that is, the whole triangle. And it may be seen in this case as the resultant of the law of four. The tarot itself is a very ancient origin. Pappas in the book, The Tarot of the Bohemians, tells a story. A time followed when Egypt, no longer able to struggle against her invaders, prepared to die honorably. Then the Egyptian savants held a great assembly to arrange how the knowledge, which until that date had been confined to men judged worthy to receive it, should be saved from destruction. At first they thought of confiding these secrets to virtuous men secretly, recruited by the initiates themselves who would transmit these ideas then from generation to generation. But one priest, observing that virtue is a most fragile thing and most difficult to find, and at all events in a continuous line, proposed to confide these scientific traditions to vice. The latter, he said, 
would never fail completely, though we are and through it, we are sure of a long and durable preservation of these principles. This opinion was evidently adopted, and the game of cards usually associated with a vice was preferred. The small plates were then engraved with the mysterious figures which formerly taught the most important scientific secrets, and since then, the card players have transmitted this tarot from generation to generation, far better than most virtuous men upon earth would have done. The Tarot of the Bohemians by Pappas expresses well the general feeling aroused by the Tarot and the idea of its incomprehensible origin. Listen to these emotional descriptions as you look at the images of the Tarot cards up on the screen coming from Ospensky's book, The New Model of the Universe. Okay, so I will start with card two, the High Priestess. When I had lifted the first veil and entered the outer court of the Temple of Initiations, I saw in the half-darkness the figure of a woman sitting on a high throne between two columns of the temple, one white and one black. Mystery breathed from her and around her. Sacred symbols gleamed on her green robes. On her head was a golden tiara surmounted with a two-horned moon. On her knees she held two crossed keys in an open book. Between the two columns behind the woman hung a second veil, all embroidered with green leaves and pomegranate fruits. And the voice said to me, In order to enter the temple, it is necessary to lift the second veil and pass between the two columns. And in order to pass between them, it is necessary to obtain possession of the keys, to read the book and understand the symbols. The knowledge of good and evil awaits you. Are you ready? And with deep suffering, I felt that I was afraid to enter the temple. Are you ready? repeated the voice. I was silent. My heart nearly stopped with fear. I could not utter a word. I felt that a precipice was opening before me and that I should not dare to take a single step. Then the woman, sitting between the two columns, turned her face to me and looked at me without saying a word. And I understood that she was speaking to me, but my fear only grew greater. I knew that I should not enter the temple. Card 21, The World. An, unexpe an unexpected vision rose before me. A circle resembling a wreath woven from rainbows and lightning revolved between sky and earth. It revolved with frenzied speed, blinding me with its brilliance. And in this radiance and fire, music sounded and soft singing was heard and also the peals of thunder and the roar of a hurricane and the noise of mountain avalanches and the rumble of earthquakes. The circle whirled with a terrible noise, touching earth and sky, and in its center I saw the dancing figure of a young and beautiful woman, wrapped in a light transparent scarf, with a magic wand in her hand. And at the sides of the circle there became visible to me the four beasts of the apocalypse, one like a lion, the second like a calf, the third with the face of a man, and the fourth like a flying eagle. The vision disappeared as suddenly as it had appeared. A strange stillness descended on the earth. What does this mean? I asked in astonishment. It is the image of the world, said the voice. It must be understood before one can pass through the gates of the temple. This is the world in the circle of time, amid the four principles. This is what you always see, but never understand. Understand that all you see, things and phenomena, are but the hieroglyphs of higher ideas. Card three, the Empress. I felt the breath of spring, and with the fragrance of violets, violets, lilies of the valley, and the wild cherry, the soft singing of elves was borne toward me. Brooks murmured, green treetops rustled, innumerable choirs of birds were singing, bees were droning, and everywhere was the joyful living breath of nature. The sun shone softly and mildly, a small white cloud hung over the woods. In the midst of a green glade where bloomed the first yellow primroses on a throne encircled with ivy and blossoming lilac, I saw the empress. A green wreath adorned her golden hair. Twelve stars shone above her head. Two snow-white wings were visible behind her back, and in one hand she held a scepter. With a tender smile, the empress looked about her, and beneath her glance, flowers opened and buds unfolded their sticky green leaves. 
the whole of her dress was covered with flowers, as though every flower that opened was reflected or imprinted on it and became a part of her garment. The sign of Venus, the goddess of love, was carved upon her marble throne. O oh, queen of life, I said, why is everything so radiant and joyful and happy around you? Do you not know that there is the gray, weary autumn, the cold, white winter? Do you not know that there is death, black graves, cold, damp sepulchres, cemeteries? How can you smile joyfully looking at the unfolding flowers when all dies and all will die, and when all is condemned to death, even that which is not yet born? The empress looked at me smiling, and beneath her smile I suddenly felt that in my soul the flower of some bright understanding was opening, as though something was being revealed to me, and the terror of death began to depart from me. Card 20, The Resurrection of the Dead I saw an icy plain, a chain of snow mountains shut off the horizon. A cloud arose and grew until it covered a quarter of the sky, and in the midst of the cloud there appeared two fiery wings, and I saw the messenger of the empress. He raised his trumpet and blew a loud and imperious blast, and in response the plain trembled, and with loud reverberating echoes the mountain answered. And one after and the other, the graves in the plain began to open, and out of them people came forth, young children and old folk and men and women. And, and they stretched out their arms to the messenger of the empress and tried to catch the sound of the trumpet. And in the sound of the trumpet I felt the smile of the empress, and in the opening graves I saw the unfolding flowers, and in the extended hands I smelt the fragrance of flowers, and I understood the mystery of birth and death. Card four is the emperor. After I had studied the first three numbers, it was given to me to understand the great law of four, the alpha and omega of all. I saw the emperor on a high throne of stone, which was decorated with the four rams' heads. A golden hem helmet gleamed on his brow. His white beard fell over his purple mantle. In one hand he held a sphere, the symbol of his possessions and in the other a scepter in the form of the Egyptian cross, the sign of his power over birth. I am the great law, said the emperor. I am the name of God. The four letters of his name are in me, and I am in everything. I am in the four principles. I am in the four elements. I am in the four seasons. I am in the four quarters of the earth. I am in the four signs of the tarot. I am action. I am resistance. I am completion. I am result. For him who knows the way to see me, there are no mysteries on the earth. As the earth contains fire, water, and air, as the fourth letter of the name continues the contains the first three, and itself becomes the first, so my scepter contains the complete triangle and bears in itself the seed of a new triangle. And while the emperor spoke, his helmet and the golden armor visible beneath his mantle shone ever more and more fiercely until I could no longer bear their radiance and dropped my eyes. And when I tried to raise them again, before me was an all-pervading radiance and light and fire, and I fell prostrate, worshipping the fiery word. Card 19, The Sun. After this, when I first saw the sun, I understood that it is itself the expression of the fiery word and the sign of the emperor. The great luminary shone and gave warmth, Below, tall golden sunflowers nodded their heads. And I saw two children in a garden behind a high enclosure. The sun poured its hot rays on them, and it seemed to me that a golden rain was falling upon them, as though the sun poured molten gold over the earth. For an instant I closed my eyes, and when I opened them again I saw that every ray of the sun was the scepter of the emperor, which bore within it life. And I saw how, Beneath the sharp points of these rays, the mystical flowers of the waters were unfolding everywhere, and how the rays penetrated into these flowers, and how the whole of nature was continually born from the mysterious union of the two principles. Next we have card five, the Hierophant. I saw the great master in the temple. He was seated on a golden throne, set upon a purple daze. He wore the robes of a high priest in a golden tiara. Under his feet I saw two crossed keys, 
and two initiates were bowed before him, and he spoke to them. I heard the sound of his voice, but could not understand one word that he said. Either he spoke in a language unknown to me, or there was something that prevented me from understanding the meaning of his words. And the voice said to me, He speaks only for those who have ears to hear. But woe unto them who believe that they hear before they have really heard, or hear that which he does not say, or put their own words in place of his words. They will never receive the keys of understanding. And it is of them that it is said that they neither go into themselves, neither suffer them that are entering to go in. Card 18, The Moon A desolate plain stretched out before me. The full moon looked down as if wrapped in meditation. Under her wavering light, the shadows lived their own peculiar lives, and there were black hills on the horizon. Between two gray towers wound a path, losing itself in the distance. On either side of the path, facing one another, a wolf and a dog were sitting and howling, with their muzzles raised to the moon. From a stream, a great black crayfish clambered onto the sand. A cold, heavy dew was falling. A feeling of dread overcame me. I felt the presence of a mysterious world, a world of hostile spirits, of corpses rising from the grave, of tormented ghosts. In the pale light of the moon, I seemed to feel the presence of phantoms. Shadows seemed to be crossing the path. Someone was waiting for me behind the towers, and it was dangerous to look back. The next card is card six, called Temptation, or in this case, The Lovers. I saw a flowering garden in a green valley surrounded by soft blue hills. In the garden, I saw a man and a woman. Elves, water nymphs, sylphs, and gnomes came to them freely. Three kingdoms of nature, stones, plants, and animals served them. To them was revealed the mystery of universal equi equilibrium, and they themselves were the symbol and expression of that equilibrium. Two triangles were united in them into a six-pointed star. Two bow-shaped magnets merged into one ellipse. High above them I saw floating the genie, who unseen guided them, and whose presence they always felt. And I noticed how from a tree on which the golden fruit was ripening, a snake crept down and whispered in the ear of the woman. And the woman listened, smiled at first incredulously, then with curiosity. Then I saw her speak to the man, and he also smiled, pointing with his hand to the garden all around him. Suddenly a cloud appeared and hid the picture from me. This is the picture of temptation, said the voice. But what constitutes the temptation? Can you understand its nature? Life is so good, I said, and the world so beautiful, the three kingdoms of nature and the four elements so obedient, that they wish to be, leave themselves the lords and masters of the world, and they could not withstand this temptation. Yes, said the voice, the wisdom which crawls on the ground said to them that they knew themselves what was good and what was evil, and they believed this, because it was pleasant to think so. And then they ceased to hear the guiding voice. Equilibrium was destroyed. The enchanted world was closed to them. Everything appeared to them in a false light, and they became mortal. This fall is the first sin of man, and is perpetually repeated, because man never ceases to believe in himself, and lives by this belief. Only when man has atoned this sin by great suffering can he pass out of the power of death and return to life. Card 17, The Star in the midst of the heavens shone a great star, and around it were seven smaller stars. Their rays were intertwined, filling space with an endless radiance and light, and each of the eight stars contained in itself all the eight stars. And beneath the shining stars, beside a blue stream, I saw a naked girl, young and beautiful. Kneeling on one knee, she poured water from two vessels, one of gold and one of silver. A small bird on a bush raised its wings and prepared for flight. For an instant, I understood that I was seeing the soul of nature. This is the imagination of nature, said the voice softly. Nature dreams, imagines, creates worlds. Learn to unite your imagination with her imagination, and nothing will ever be impossible for you. But remember, that it is impossible to see both rightly and wrongly at the same time. 
Once for all, you must make a choice, and then there can be no return. So the tarot is one of the tools that's used in conscious schools. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next week here on SBN. Be sure to hop on over to the Spiritual Broadcast Network. It's the go-to place for all things spiritual. You'll discover internet television shows that you won't find anywhere else. You can also choose from hundreds of hours of spiritual documentaries and movies. You'll enjoy on-demand and live internet television programming 24-7. Best of all, we add new dramas, comedies, talk and reality shows and more on a daily basis. So why spend countless hours searching the web when you can quickly find just what you want on the Spiritual Broadcast Network?